welcome to the Lose Weight, Live Life podcast. If you're someone who would do anything to lose weight, yet finds it impossible to stick to a diet, to eat less, or just what you think you should, this podcast is for you. I am your host, certified life and weight mindset coach, Claire McKenzie. Listen in to learn how to stop overeating, lose weight for the last time, and create a relationship with food and yourself that you love, all without diet deprivation and self-sabotage. Hi everyone and a very warm welcome to podcast episode 103. Today I'm sharing with you one of the Q&A sessions from Mindset Coaching Experience Week in early September. We ran this session ahead of the autumn 2022 enrolment in the Lose Weight Live Life Academy. Enrolment in the Academy is now closed. If you're looking for weight loss support for the remainder of 2022 and going into 2023, I am running a new small group coaching six-month program called the My One Life Mastermind and will be starting in October. If you're interested, please email support at weightwhispering.com and I'll get you the details. So the question on the screen for those of you who are listening and watching the replay, I said, whilst we're waiting, please tell us what's one thing you've done today that you're proud of. It doesn't matter how small it is. And this is just one of those little reminders that the more we can appreciate ourselves, feel proud of ourselves, congratulate ourselves, help us step into that positive way of thinking about the things that we do, no matter how small, okay, even if it is having like a glass of water when you often forget, it does not matter how small, it's all about you getting used to acknowledging and appreciating yourself. And when you do that, your brain will naturally, because it feels good, your brain will naturally want you to do more things that feel good. It's a bit like getting things done if you ever write a to-do list and then you tick them off. You just get that little tiny little bit of satisfaction from it. Well, we can do that for ourselves, for the things that we do that we don't normally, we wouldn't normally give a moment to give ourselves credit for. And the more we can create that, the more our sort of like, you know, inner being, so to speak, is going to want to get that reward. We can give that reward, reward, that validation to ourselves. So yeah, a quick look at what everyone said. There's a good few comments here, which is fantastic. So Irene says she's joined the Academy. That's brilliant. Congratulations, Irene. I know you messaged me earlier about the form. I'm so pleased you got that working for you. Great to have you join us. So I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you who have joined as we you know, work together closely over the next 12 weeks and beyond. And I know some of you have signed up for a year, so you're stuck with me <laughs> for a year. So you'll be sick of me by the end of it. But anyway, but that's just fantastic. And brilliant. You're going to get to go through the food for thought part of the program and then working on your relationship with yourself and also the life coaching aspect as well. Michelle says, I treated myself and had my nails done instead of treating myself with chocolate. And the great win, a great example of swapping a food treat for a non-food treat. Well done to you. Rachel says, I didn't fall to my mother-in-law's feeder behavior, but there was a post in the Facebook group on that earlier. Congratulations, Rachel. Well done. Brilliant. Adele says, I cleared a backlog of work I needed to do instead of eating something to avoid doing it. Amazing. There's two, I give yourself two wins there for that. So really well done to you. And Rachel says, and I feel good about it. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? How we think, you know, when we can get to the point where we're feeling good about making these changes that are for us, um, totally different to a diet mentality. That's what we want to be doing. Claire says, had a break instead of a chocolate bar. Yeah, another really important one, noticing that sometimes we want to eat because we need a break and taking the break, giving ourselves what we really want. I mean, that doesn't feel like it, but what we really want is meeting our needs there. Andrea says she'll watch a replay, she's got to go to her parents. Helen says she kept to her meal plan. It's brilliant. Well done, Helen. I know you're in the academy. So well done to you. That's fantastic. Florence says, talked myself out of eating some nuts and raisins, which would have ended up with me finishing the whole packet. Great example of talking back to yourself, this idea of talking to ourselves more than we listen. You've all learned so much this week. I'm so pleased. Charlene says, I've been really proud of how conscious I have been and asking myself whether that is really what I need. I've not eaten half as much as I would have done. Brilliant. Fantastic. Really some amazing examples here. I'm so pleased for all of you. So Ali has also found herself being more focused at work and she's been listening to the podcasts. Julie is proud of communicating with people in this group. I know for some of you, it may be the first time that you've sort of spoken to a group of people who you don't know on Facebook before. And 
really well done for, yeah, I'm so pleased that you feel proud of yourself for doing that. Kept to a plan even under stress. Well done, Sue. That's that's fantastic. Really well done for acknowledging that. Holly says she's been more motivated. Cami says, proud I tidied up an area that was annoying both me and my hubby. Genevieve says, really feeling pleased how my mindset has changed. He just jumped there. Um, delighted how easy this week has been. Fantastic. Really pleased for you. Louise is trying to keep focused. So practicing keeping focused. Sometimes when we say we're trying, it feels a little bit as if it's outside of our control. So just maybe just try that thought on. We try thoughts on a bit like trying on clothes. We say them to ourselves and see how they feel in our body. So I wonder if practicing keeping focused, how that sit, may sit just a tiny bit more, feel a bit more positive for you. Trudy says, I've lost three pounds this week, feeling really motivated. Brilliant. Congratulations, Trudy. I know quite a few of you have been posting to say that you have lost weight just by being here this week and participating in this week. So that's brilliant. And Louise says, listening to the podcast found the inspiration in those. Fantastic. We've also got some comments in the Zoom room. I'm going to quickly go through those and just a few of them, and then we will crack on with the questions. So Margaret says, I didn't want to go out for a walk on my own. So I took the bus to the shops and walked home downhill on the way back. Brilliant. I like your strategic thinking, Margaret. That's really well done. Joanne says, I signed up for the Academy. Congratulations. Really looking forward to getting to know you as well. And also was into my work and forgot the rugby was on. Go all the All Blacks. Fantastic. Yeah, I like watching a rugby game too. Miss my son not playing rugby. Anyway, and Wendy says, I missed the thread for proud moments. I have had a really stressful day. I made a plan for both food and expected problem spots at the beginning of the day. So you anticipated what your challenges would be. Amazing. I went for a walk at a low point. As a result, I have not eaten off my plan all day. Amazing, Wendy. Really, really well done. So proud of all of you. Um, you are all doing brilliantly. Okay, so questions that I'm going to answer this evening. Let me just bring those across over here. So I've just sort of picked out some questions. I will say if I've got the name, the name of everybody, I'm just going to say the first name of the person who posted it. So that if you are looking for a response to your question, then you'll know that I'm talking about your question. So Sarah posted and said, it's hard to know in a moment of consciously choosing to eat something that isn't super healthy, but not enormous in brackets, whether that could be seen as going against black and white thinking and the diet mentality. So sort of self-compassionate and wise, or is it the primal and younger part managing to manipulate and get in under the radar? I wonder how to balance the wise choices with moments of reasonable amounts of not completely healthy foods so we don't go mad and overeat from a deprivation mindset. Okay, this is a really great question. And it is, as you, I think you suspect from the way that you've asked the question, it's really understanding what is going on in our brain when we are weighing up the decision of whether we should eat something or not eat something or whether we should have choice A or choice B. And this is actually exactly this is actually exactly what we cover in module two of the Food for Thought program. This is the part where I talk to you about hacking your brain. I mentioned that yesterday. And what we do is we avoid making decisions in the moment. So when you are making a decision in the moment, the majority of the basis of that decision is being made by the your primal brain, the part of your brain that is focused on survival. And it's focused on in the moment survival. And to that part of your brain, the maybe the tastier option could be a more highly refined food option, the easier option, whatever, or the option that you think is going to give you more pleasure or comfort is what your primal brain is going to argue for. And even though your primal brain's primal, it's pretty sneaky and it has some pretty good arguments. That's not to say that you won't also be aware of, you know, some of those thoughts about, well, I said I wasn't going to have this or, you know, I might regret it in the morning. Your higher human brain will be there as a part of that decision making, but it feels quite difficult to know what to do. It feels quite sort of heavy. You just more often than not, it's easy to sort of have your primal brain make the decision. So the way that we work around that is to look at a practice of choosing what we want to do ahead of time. And I'm, there's going to be exceptions to that as a rule. So, you know, there's always going to be exceptions. But for the most part, when we do that, what it also enables us to do, it's not just so that we don't have whatever it is that we might be wanting to have in the moment. It's so that we can understand 
what is going on for us. And we can get very clean about thinking about what your higher human brain decision would like to be in that point ahead of time, because it's already anticipated it versus what it is that your primal brain wants you to do in the moment. And a little hack for you there. Most, I mean, our primal brain will tell us things like, it's a great opportunity, they look so delicious, it would be you know, rude not to accept, all of these sorts of things. The reality is, for the most part, in the, the age in which we live today, most foods are available to us whenever we want to have them. Okay, we might need to go to the shops, we might need to go to a cafe, we might need to reschedule to go to the restaurant, but most of the time they're available to us. So if it is a pre planned occasion, then I would as much as possible encourage you to think about it ahead of time. Because when you're thinking about it, when you're in sort of you're in strategic planning mode, you're much able to engage the capacity and resource resourcefulness and you know longer term thinking and sort of be able to project ahead, which your higher human brain is capable of doing. So you're going to make the decision from that Point, which is going to be taking all factors into consideration, not just the in the moment pleasure that you are maybe seeking. And if, but if in the moment when these opportunities present themselves, a little hack that I like to say is, if I want this, then I can plan to have it another time. So you're not denying yourself whatever it is, because that will push us back into diet mentality. You're just saying to yourself, I'm not sure right now, of if I like the reasons why I want to have whatever it is. So what I'm going to do is choose to not have it now. And then when I get home, reflect on it. And if I want to, I can decide then that I'm going to either go back to the cafe. Next time I go to the shops, I'm going to get that and have it and enjoy it. And that's a good way to sort of separate those out. Okay. The next question, I picked out a question about the scales and weighing. I noticed quite a long thread about it. I did talk about the scales a little bit yesterday, but I just wanted to revisit this because there were an awful lot of comments on it. It was a longish post. I'm sorry, I haven't got the name of the the lady who posted it. I'm going to read the beginning bit and I'm going to read the end bit because I think those are the two points that are going to be most useful for you to to explain the situation. So this was what was written in the post. What's the point? I've been on my latest diet for a week. What's the point thought? I've been on my latest diet for a week. I last weighed myself on Thursday and the weight loss had been going okay. I don't know whether to weigh myself this morning and maybe ruin my day. And then the end part of the post said, I have put 1.2 pounds on overnight. I'm now back to just thinking, what's the point? My family had a takeaway at the weekend. I had a homemade sweet potato curry with no rice. I had poached eggs with bacon medallions instead of the fry up I wanted. I had absolutely no alcohol and I still put on weight. And this, this this post is really illustrating two things really, really well, which is why I've picked it, because I know that uh, so many of you will resonate with having had thoughts like this. We, and I think, again, this comes from the diet, diet, diet mentality, the expectation that if we eat a certain way today, we should expect to see that as a result on the scale tomorrow. And the truth is weight loss does not work like that. It really doesn't work like that. I encourage you to look at your weight loss over a two week period and look at the two, the two week, the sort of the fortnight trend. And if you're losing weight over that fortnight, that is what you want to be focused on because there's so much impacting the weight that our body will be on the day to day. I think I mentioned these yesterday. It would be like the weather how much water we're retaining, what's going on for us hormonally. So water retention can be impacted by the foods we eat, the weather, the amount of exercise that we're doing, what's going on for us hormonally, so many different things. And so it just reminded me actually of another question that I saw earlier and I said I'd speak to, and I think I forgot to put that in here. Anyway, so there's so many things also in terms of your digestion, what's going on with your digestion will also have an impact on that. So to sort of see that you've gained 1.2 pounds overnight is not going to be that you have gained 1.2 pounds of fat. It's just that with everything that's going on in your body, it's weighing a little bit heavier. It means absolutely nothing. And I see this over and over and over again. And I've, of course, did it myself for years where you try what you're sort of like, try really hard, and then you expect to see a result and you don't get it and you feel cheated and you feel miserable and deprived and you're thinking all of these thoughts about what's the point so the first point part of this is you really want to be weighing yourself over a two-week period and I said 
that my suggestion, if you can manage your mind around it, is to weigh frequently, but only take notice of the trend, not the individual measurements. They want you to weigh frequently so you get familiar seeing all of the ups and downs and they become more neutralized for you. Some of you will not be anywhere close to being that comfortable getting on the scales. If that is you, then I suggest for the moment, because you're going to have lots of other things to focus on, you don't don't just forget about the scales for the moment. Take measurements, use clothes to sort of assess things. If the scales brings up a lot of mind drama for you and is like and, is that, and that causes you challenges to not derail, whether that is derail because you think it's not working or derail because you think it is working and you want to celebrate, it goes both ways. I really encourage you to leave the scales to one side. There's one other thing that you can do, which is that if you normally weigh in like stones and pounds, switch the scales to kilos and it will neutralize the numbers. The numbers will start to feel a lot more like just mathematical numbers rather than have all of that emotional meaning tied to them. If you don't relate to what you are in kilograms and you never have done, it only works if you really have no clue how many kilograms you are. Okay. So that was the first part of that question I wanted to address. The second part of this question is noticing that you, the way in which you're talking around the changes that you have made is leading you to feel miserable. So what's the point? My family had a takeaway. I had a homemade sweet potato curry with no rice. I had this instead of the fry up that I wanted. I had no alcohol. I still put on weight. When we think, when we tell ourselves that we are eating differently to how we want to eat, then it feels like we are, we feel restricted. Okay. We feel deprived. We feel miserable. It feels like really hard work. And this is why we sort of contend to sort of sometimes with the diet, it's almost like we white knuckle it. We just sort of like grimace and try and just grin and bear it to get to the end of wherever it is we're trying to get to. And then we relax. And it was such an awful experience. We can't continue that in order to maintain our weight because the truth is that once you get to the weight that you want to be, the eating that you're doing to get you down to the weight that you want to be will be very, very, will not be very different to how you want to eat to maintain your weight. So we have to get comfortable eating in a way that will enable us to lose weight. And at the moment, you are telling yourself that you don't want to be eating poached egg with bacon instead of the fry up that you wanted. And this is where I really encourage you to do your work. How is it true that you wanted the poached egg and bacon and not the fry up, I guess, that everyone else was having? Okay. It's true because you want to lose weight, be healthier, all of those things. You can also say to yourself, why don't I want to have the fry up? So you can do it that way around as well. Why do I want to have the eggs and bacon? Why don't I want to have the fry up? And write down all the reasons and keep redirecting your brain back to remembering that actually you want to eat in a way that is going to enable you to lose weight. And be kind to your, it's so much kinder to yourself to stop telling yourself that that's not true. And if it, if you can't find that to be true, then I would encourage you to say, okay, go, you know, if I can, I, I will eat what I, if that's what I, what you truly want, eat what you want and you will come back around to realizing it's not what you want. It feels like it can feel difficult. It can feel like being in this place of conflict with yourself. Those of you who feel this and it's really normal, really, really normal. I really encourage you to focus on this and sort of really resolve so you feel like you truly want to eat in a way that is going to help you be healthier, lose weight, whatever it is for you. Because if you once you do, your weight loss journey is going to be so much easier, so much easier. So that it's not that every day feels like an absolute battle. Okay. I've know what it's like. I've been there many, many different diets, many times over. Doesn't need to feel that way. Okay. Karen had posted a question. And by the way, do, if there are questions in the Facebook group, then, you know, do, do post them in the Facebook group and I'll come to those as well. Karen had posted a, oh, that was it. Let me talk about. So somebody had posted, and I'm really sorry because I realized now I forgot to copy and paste the post. Somebody had posted about having sparkling water. I think you said you normally had a drink in the evening and you've been having sparkling water and you had gained some weight. And I can't remember exactly how, for how long you've been having sparkling water. I don't, I don't know if it was like one evening or a couple of evenings. And I think you've gained a pound. Really same point is that I really encourage you to do whatever you're doing for a period of two weeks before deciding it doesn't work or making a change. There's a lag between how we're eating 
and that result showing up on the scale. And if we keep making changes, we never are going to get an understanding of what's going on for us. So the only thought that came to mind for me is that, I mean, I don't know what, I can't remember if it was sparkling water or if it was something else that's sparkling, whether there is something in that that is causing some sort of inflammation. If it's just sparkling water, then I'm thinking not too sure. But also another thought that came to me is alcohol. I think you would swapped it out for alcohol. Alcohol is obviously a, brain's not with it tonight. I think I've got a bit tired <laughs> after this week. Sorry. You know, it can be quite dehydrating is what I'm trying to say. And so that could be a reason is why you, you maybe if you've had a drink of the evening, then you weigh yourself. It's a diuretic. That's what I was trying to say. You maybe just your body may just be not be holding on to quite so much water. It could just be an extra little bit of water weight there. OK, the next post that I picked out from the Facebook group, it was Karen who had said, day one homework. I have a lack of self-worth and belief. I'll never be able to lose weight and keep it off as I have never done before. I also accept my bad eating habits because that's what I've always done. My bad habits are deeply ingrained. And then went on to, and this is a great, great homework, by the way. I just picked it out because it was sort of typed in very easily so I could read it very quickly. I made excuses to order an Indian takeaway late one night. I was stressed, drops of shirt, nothing in the fridge. I deserve a treat. My question is, how can I stop doing this? Okay. And you did answer your question. And again, really, so whenever you have a question, this is for all of you. Whenever you find yourself, you know, why am I doing this? Answer your question. Answer your question and you and the first answer that you have, use that sort of digging deeper, digging deeper. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this because why do I think that or something like that? And so I just really wanted to chose to comment on this because I know a lot of you will also have thoughts about feeling a lack of self-worth and also a lack of belief. And sometimes when we have a lack of belief and I'm sort of saying things like it's really important you believe that you can do this, that can feel a little bit scary or a little bit worrying. And so I just had a couple of reframe thoughts for you as suggestions. If you're someone who's thinking, I have a lack of self-worth, you might want to think instead. So when you notice that thought, you're like, ah, there we go. I've got see you thought. Instead, you might want to think, I'm going to upgrade that thought and think I'm willing to figure out how to improve my self-worth. If you lack belief, you might want to, if you have a thought, sorry, that you lack belief, you might want to swap that to, I don't trust whatever it is you're lacking belief in enough to have belief yet. Okay. It's just nudging it that little bit forward to take you a step closer. None of you will believe 100% that you can absolutely do this and change your relationship with food for life and lose your weight permanently every single day until you do it and you see it for yourself. So some days it might feel like the absolutely believe you believe it. But other days you'll feel like, I don't, I don't, I don't believe it. It's really normal. Okay. It's really difficult to create 100% belief in our brain until we've achieved something. We have to borrow belief and go with it. Okay. Anne said, when I'm not working and lying around the house, I just binge eat and it's all sweets, etc. even though I'm not hungry. I think it could be boredom. How can I stop this? So I would really, first of all, get very specific on the patterns of the behavior. So I would try not to change your behavior for whether it is a few days, I don't know how often this comes up or a week, whatever it is for you. And I would observe yourself a bit like a science experiment. We're looking for triggers. It could be, as you say, when you have, you know, you have thoughts that you've got nothing to do, creating boredom. Is it a certain day of the week? Is it a certain time of the day? Ask yourself, you can ask yourself in the moment, what, what's going on for me here? Why do I want this? Sometimes we feel discomfort being with ourselves. So it could be you, it could be boredom. It could be you escaping yourself if you're not that fussed about your own company. I encourage you to te- keep questioning what it is. If you think it is about boredom, then ask yourself, why am I bored? Why am I bored? If it comes up and you think of something like it just feels like a dissatisfaction, why are you dissatisfied? You want to find those thoughts that are in your mind that even though you might not be aware of them, you might not be aware of them as conscious thoughts, they're still there. And then there's a number of things you can do. So taking boredom as an example, if it's bored, once you've explored what's going on for you and why you're bored, you'll be in a much better position to help yourself find solutions. And those solutions might look like you creating different circumstances so you're not bored, so that you relax outside of the home, so that you do other things. So that's one way to help yourself. 
Another way to help yourself might be to have different thoughts about being bored. So what creates the feeling of bored is think is a thought. So if you are thinking, I've got nothing to do, I'm bored, that could be a way that you think about having some time at home on your own when you haven't got work and other things going on. Another person may think, oh, I'm just so glad it's in peace and quiet to relax. I'm so glad that I don't have to do anything. There's nothing on my to-do list to get done. So I can focus on doing these things. Someone else might think, you know, oh, I just really appreciate this time because I enjoy reading so much. So what do you want to think in order to not feel bored? So the problem is not the fact that you've got nothing to do or, you know, it's you're not working and you're in the house. It's how you're thinking about it. And it might be, there might be much more things come up there that then need addressing. And the last option is to allow yourself to feel bored. Sometimes when I'm not working and I'm in the house, I feel bored and that's okay. And I can feel bored and I can feel bored and I can feel bored. An emotion for me, such as boredom, is not one that sort of passes quickly. So it can hang around for a few hours. Sometimes it's useful to think of emotions like that as a bit like having a heavy bag on your shoulder. You know that it's there, but you can carry on with your day regardless. All right. Sharon. Sharon said, hi, I hope this is okay to post here. I'm pre-diabetic, really struggling to understand what I should be eating, meals and things. Can anyone help me? And you're overweight too. And so really it's looking at what I would call sort of healthy, healthy eating guidelines. So I would start with looking to reduce foods that are high in refined carbohydrates and added sugars. Refined carbohydrates are those foods that contain flour. It could be highly processed chips. It could be highly processed rice and foods that have been treated or broken down in some way. Um, even thinking about sort of, you know, an apple versus a glass of apple juice. The apple juice is refined. Okay. The apple is not going to spike your blood sugar anywhere near as much as a glass of juice. There's a lot of research being done in this area at the moment, actually. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that, because I think it's a real sort of growing area of research. And then foods with added sugars look for hidden sugars in some savory foods, as well as all the obvious ones, like all of the sweet pastries, chocolates, ice cream, all of those things. So really look to understand where you are having foods that are have a lot of refined carbohydrates and added sugars in your diet. And an approach I would encourage you to take again is to not to change anything or to look back and reflect for a few days so that you can you can sort of have a look at everything and see, you know, what foods might be high in added sugars and refined carbohydrates. Just to, again, be that sort of science experiment for yourself of understanding how they're cropping up in your life. You might also want to evaluate how much your balance of eating non-processed foods versus processed foods versus ultra processed foods and look to limit the ultra processed foods and increase the non-processed foods and increase the variety of those non-processed foods. There's again research coming, uh, research that shows that the more fruits and vegetables, the more plant-based foods we eat, the greater variety we have the better it is for our gut microbiome and that that also has a positive impact on our insulin levels as well, which is of course what it's all about when we're pre-diabetic. Increase your healthy fats, so limit your saturated fats, but increase your healthy fats, healthy fats, olive oil, nuts, salmon, oily fish, not having those too often, but you're looking to increase your oily fats. Think about drinking lots of water, Think about walking if you're not doing much exercise or doing more walking or doing exercise. And also think about how you are eating your foods throughout the day. Are you having set meals at set times with a decent gap in between your meal? Or are you sort of grazing and picking throughout all of the day or a part of the day? Because we want to give our body the opportunity to clear our blood of the glucose, of the fats, from the foods that we've eaten before we have our next meal or our next snack and load them up again. If you have, if your diet has been had a high number of foods with added sugar and refined carbohydrates, then when you look to reduce them, expect to, you might expect to feel hungry and you might feel a bit tired, but know that that is normal and that it will pass. And then you'll feel less hungry and you'll have more energy. And what you can do is to sort of plan to take care of yourself for the first week or so whilst you're looking to make some changes. Okay. 
And then there was another added comment on here. And I so I forgot to put your name in. Um, I'm type two diabetic and I've been having a few hypos recently caused by sugar, sugar levels being too low. So I'd appreciate some help with, with what to eat, please. I can't really advise you specifically because obviously I don't know your medical situation. I don't know if you'll take, if you're medicated or unmedicated. Um, in t- what all I can really advise is that you keep really good records and you look for patterns and that you're also aware of, you know, yes, the foods that you're eating, but also what else is your life looking like in terms of things like stress management, sleep, exercise, all of those things will contribute to what is going on with your blood sugar levels. So can't advise on foods, but I would also say that if you are having hypos, I'm guessing you are medicated, then if you are changing your diet, so this is for anyone really who's a type two diabetic, taking medication, if you're looking to make changes to your diet, if healthy changes, such as cutting out refined carbs and added sugars, you must speak to your medical team about it. Because if you're medicated, then it could well mean that you will, they will need to adapt your medication so that you're taking less of it. Okay. So yeah, that's just something to say there. In the academy, I would say one of the first things we do is create a food framework. So even if you have something like type two diabetes, if you have another health condition that limits what you eat, if you've got food intolerances, anything at all, you're never being told what to eat. You're guided through the process. It's quite a detailed process of figuring out how you want to eat. Again, notice that really important word, want to eat in order to create the results that you want, which is for most of you will be starting to lose some weight. And so that is flexible enough that it will work with for you, no matter what dietary restrictions may be in place for you. Jeanette says, tips for allowing the urge to snack to pass when at an event meeting, when snacks are displayed within reach the whole time. Yeah, this is one I struggle with. And so I was reading this and I was thinking about it. And I think that more often than not, and maybe I don't socialize enough for it to be a problem. <laughs> I was going to say more often than not, I end up picking at the snacks still. And and I just, it's almost like I just can't be bothered to punch my mind around it. And so I just wanted to say that because if that is the, you know, the one thing, then it's still possible. You don't have to be perfect at that. You can still lose your weight, and lose your weight unless you're, you're socializing every single night, then that may not be the case. But some tips that I would suggest are make sure that you, so you could eat before you go. So you're not hungry. You could definitely encourage you to make sure you're well hydrated and have some water. You could decide just to not almost like not start because if you start, if it's harder and this is again, it's not about depriving yourself. It's about you choosing. Is it easier for me to not have the first couple of snacks? And then I don't sort of get that taste for wanting that moorishness of it. Is that kinder to myself or is it kind to myself to have the first few and then allow myself to feel the urge and manage the, my mind around it? It's your choice. There's no right or wrong. It's just what is easier for you. Other things that I would do is stand with my back to them so they're not in my line of sight or stand away from them. If they are being offered by the host, then really just love, just get really good at saying no, thank you. No, thank you. If it's something they've made, it looks lovely, but no, thank you. The more you say that, the easier it gets. You can always become a little bit habitual that you just say no, thank I do find myself doing that. So the crisp bowl, I probably struggle with. Canapes that I don't want at parties, I have absolutely no trouble saying no, thank you to. It's just weird, isn't it? Some things become far easy and other things are still our sort of little nemesis things. So yeah, if we are having, if I'm serving snacks, so if we are, and I, I love having sort of nibbly food, drinks and nibbles, that sort of thing. If I'm doing that for us at home, I will, there will be a much greater selection of snacks that I'm comfortable eating. So, you know, no pastry snacks or anything like that. Um, fewer crisps, lots of olives, lots of sort of healthy nuts, those sorts of things. But also what I might do is do a huge plate of chopped vegetables. And then I can, if I can be sort of mindlessly eating on those and I don't have to pay quite so much attention. It's just, again, it's a bit of a hack to make it easier for me. Also ask yourself, how much do you enjoy those snacks? Is this food that you would really enjoy eating or is it just, are you just having it because it's there and it's a little bit habitual? Because if you do, you might just decide that, "Mm, actually, I don't, that's not something. If I'm going to have some, I'd rather choose to eat food for pleasure and for it to be something that I really, really, really enjoy than just be mindlessly nibbling away on these snacks. Okay, the Facebook group's, Absolutely frozen. I'm hoping we're still in there. 
Yeah, I think we are. Okay. So Claire posted, how do you involve yourself in celebrations where there is food you might not necessarily have chosen yourself to eat without appearing rude by not eating it? I'm struggling with the idea that you should eat for the person you want to be in some situations. That's not possible. How does occasionally having those foods fit in with that mindset? How do I justify it to myself? How do I eat those foods? I'm constantly telling myself I don't need to eat. So, and I think you've just joined the Academy. I'm not sure. I I think I might have seen your name. So in the Academy, we do have a couple of worksheets. I'll be in your workbook. One is for helping you to plan for situations where you want to make an exception when you are dining out, socializing, whatever the occasion may be. And the other one is for when you don't want to make an exception. And we call an exception you know, when you're eating outside of your, how you normally want to be eating sort of week to week. And I think the actual strategy that you would take very much would depend on the detail of the individual scenario. And going through the worksheet for that will help you figure that out. So a couple of examples for me. If I was going to someone's house for a dinner party where they had asked me beforehand if there's any foods that I don't eat, I would have said to them, I don't tend to eat refined carbohydrates, for example, but please don't make any changes. I will just, you know, choose to have whatever is the food is without without having that. And I'm really happy to do that. And I just wanted to let you know so that you know. And I find that's useful to let them know ahead of time. If they don't ask, I wouldn't contact them to say that to them. And if there was, you know, something like a dish that I wouldn't normally eat at home, then I would have a small portion of it. If I can, if I'm there when it's being served, I would say, oh, just a little bit of that, please. Just a little bit of that. Oh, it looks delicious. Not that hungry tonight. Just a little bit. If the plate is served and it comes to me and it's a lot more than I would normally eat, then I will leave. I will leave the food. And that wouldn't have felt comfortable to me a while back, but it feels comfortable to me now because I can really massively appreciate the food. I can thoroughly enjoy the food. I don't need to have a larger quantity of it to appreciate it and make it more enjoyable. And when that feels like the truth for myself, it's so much easier to, you know, to leave some food on the plate and for it to not mean anything negative. If it is a situation where it is, like I said, the canapes being offered, birthday cake being offered, anything like that, I've practiced saying no thank you a lot and it does get easier. And the reason we don't want to say no thank you is because so many of us, you know, we're brought up to be taught that it's polite to be accepting and say, oh, yes, please, that would be lovely. But it's, I've decided that it's not worth it for me, because if I'm going to be eating foods that are, you know, for me, high in the refined carbohydrates, then I want it to be foods of my choosing, not foods that I'm sort of like forcing myself to eat, because I'm too uncomfortable to say no, thank you. So I mean, you know, incredibly polite, incredibly appreciative of what's on offer. But the more you practice saying no, thank you, the easier it gets. And I would really think you say, what do you think about it before you go? Absolutely think about it before you go. Think about what is going to be difficult about it. Um, Think about the different scenarios. Sometimes we are very reluctant to say no, thank you, because we're going to draw attention to ourselves. And, um, And that can be quite tricky if we're not comfortable with that. Maybe we'll be worried that people will say something to us like, oh, you want a diet or, you know what I mean, or or something. We don't, we're not comfortable having a conversation about whether or not we're on a diet and we don't want to have that conversation. And so I would definitely try and avoid, have avoided that conversation. But yeah, I think, again, depends on the specific scenario of what's going on. I think that is all the questions that I took out of the Facebook group. If you've got any other questions, please do pop them into the Q&A box or in the chat on the Zoom room. Okay, so any questions? If I don't join the Academy now for autumn, will there be an opportunity to join another time? I expect to open the Academy up again in January. So it would normally be mid-January when we would open it up again. Okay, thank you for your question. Let me just scroll back up here and see what questions we've got in the Facebook group. You're still reading comments about things you're proud of. Yeah, brilliant. More things you're proud of. See if we've got any questions. How often should we weigh or not to bother with the scales? You've got to choose and decide what is right for you. So I work with women who don't weigh themselves at all. I work with women who weigh themselves every day. It's I want you to make the journey easier for you. If you have, if you struggle with how you think about yourself when you stand on the scales, mark it down, make a note of it as something that you want to explore 
at some point in time, but it doesn't have to be something that you work on right away when you're getting started. You can you can sort of put that, it's like, okay, I know that I struggle with getting on and off the scales. I mean, you could just decide you're never going to weigh yourself ever again. If you want to do that, that's fine. But if you want to resolve how you feel about your weight, and if you struggle with the number on the scales, I think it will be showing up in other areas too. I think there will be some thoughts that you have about yourself and your weight and what you make that mean, not just when you stand on the scales, but maybe when you're going shopping, maybe when you're socializing. So it's just a little flag to let you know that when the time's right, it may be worthwhile to come and revisit that and explore what's going on for you. Okay. Oh, Carol says you've got all your workmates involved. Well done to you. That's fantastic. One of my issues is how to stop eating once I've started. It's very hard. In my diary, I have noticed that this desire for food lasts for about 45 minutes. But I have managed this over the week, which I'm proud of. That's fantastic. Well done. When I'm exposed to things like buffet, what can I do to help myself as the desire to eat is all consuming? Yeah, it does get, okay, so it, will, it does get easier. I would say that. Um, I can't remember if you've joined the academy or not. If you've joined the academy, then we look at this in module three. We look at everything to do with hunger, satiation levels, how to lots of different tips to sort of almost like help you read. So it's like almost like a relearning of what it feels like in your body to be satiated. It's like for so many of us, we've just totally switched off from that, either because we're used to eating everything that's on our plate, or we're just so used to going back for more and more and more and more. Really, really normal. So let me see what what's the best way to start with that right now. If it is a dinner table meal, I think I saw someone suggest this actually. You can make it easy for yourself because again, that's what we're looking to change how we're thinking about it as well, but not at the expense of finding an easy solution. A smaller plate can be a really good option. I switch to not serving the majority of our meals family style because I would always be the one picking at everything that was left in the the sort of the serving dishes at the end of the family meals. So the majority of the meals now I plate up on the side and take to the table. The exception for me will probably be Friday nights and Sunday lunches where I still you know, make an exception because that's part of the experience I want to create. But Monday to Friday or Monday to Thursday and Saturday, plate up because it makes it easier for me. I'm very careful to plate up my own food or else my husband will serve me too big a quantity. And if it is a scenario where it is something like a buffet, I would get really picky about what you want. Again, we're so used to sort of like eating all of the lovely things, but get really, really like become a connoisseur of what buffet foods do you like and what are you really not that fussed about and focus on having the foods that you really like and you really enjoy and focus on savoring those and eating them mindfully. Another option is to limit yourself to just one visit to the buffet and just be like, okay, I want to be a person that doesn't keep going back for more when there's a buffet. So I'm going to be a person that has, you know, one visit to the buffet and that's always enough. And when you think about what does that person think and what that person may think is just simply like the buffet food looks delicious. I've had plenty, there's plenty of my plate. I can really enjoy that. And that's enough for me. And it, that takes it's going to take some practice. Some of these skills take repetition and practice. The habits that you have formed for eating for most of you will have been formed over decades. So don't expect them to change overnight. It t- expect to sort of pra- work at it and practice. How do you stop water retention as my legs swell up and my joints? So there's many different reasons for water retention and legs and joints swelling up. I can't comment on your reasons. There are, in terms of foods that cause inflammation, the ultra processed, highly refined foods are going to be the foods that caused inflammation. But I don't know if that will be the cause of your water retention. So yeah, again, I I think it's a question for your medical, for your doctor, for your GP, or any medical team that you may have to ask them what sort of water retention it is. What's the underlying cause of it is probably something that you want to understand. That's, it could be, you know what I mean? Is it going to, you might want to ask if it's going to help to look at doing things like reducing your salt intake. Um, don't do that without asking a medical person for advice, because it could actually be that you want to, the opposite is true. And you need to up your salt intake because of a potassium salt imbalance. So you really need to look at your medical team to figure that out. So Ali says, I feel great. And I'm really proud of how I've handled this week. But at the back of my mind is the thought that I've been here before and I've still failed or given up. How can I get rid of that? Okay. Yeah, really important question, Ali, and thank you for asking. The crucial, crucial thing 
is that as to make this yours and like, you know, you talk about the last journey, changing your relationship with food for life, you've got to look at your fails. Okay. So, and I think I spoke about this earlier in the week, expect to fail. Now it's the only thing that's when I say that is I'm very also aware that your primal brain will use that as a reason to eat, <laughs> not yours particularly, but generally speaking, our primal brains. We, we're normally onto ourselves. If we ask ourselves truthfully, we normally know if we're telling ourselves, oh, well, it's okay to fail because Claire says we learn from this. This comes up quite a lot in the academy. So our primal brain will be tricky and tell us to have something for that purpose. It's all about understanding yourself. Each time you fail, and, and I want to use the word fail because we're so against it. We want to get comfortable with it. And what do we actually mean by failing anyway? Do we mean eating something we hadn't planned? Do we mean, oh, I don't know, whatever it is, but generally it's normally eating something we haven't planned, isn't it? And that could range from, you know, something that we didn't plan on having today that we had to a complete binge to, you know, eating all the things and not paying any attention and not being focused for a week or longer. This is, it's going, it will happen. The crucial thing is what you do next. And always when you have been eating differently to how you wanted to eat, when you get that sense of, Ugh, whatever it may be, normally fear would kick in if you're dieting because you don't, you, you tell yourself you don't know how to get back to it. It's at that point you really look to see what was going on for you. You want to understand what it was that led you to eat differently to how you thought you wanted to eat. For some of you, you might notice that you were still in diet mentality, really normal takes a way to get away from it because it's so ingrained within us. You may have been telling yourself what you should be having rather embracing it as what you wanted to have. And that can lead you to, it's a bit like willpower becoming depleted. That becomes a little bit draining. And so then you end up eating whatever it is. It could be that you have a family crisis and your routine of how you've been eating goes totally out the window and you're not equipped with the skills. You haven't learned the skills yet of how to deal with that. And so you mess up, you fail, it all goes wrong. And then you're like, OK, fine, now I can come back. Now I know I need to have a plan for when you know a family crisis happens or I get sick. That's one that happens a lot. You know, it's all very well eating this way when we are feeling, you know, healthy and all of that. But if we get sick, then it can feel a lot more difficult. And often, you know, we want to, when we're poorly, we want to turn to food to comfort ourselves, or we want to turn to whatever is quick and easy. And again, and then it can feel like we failed. But again, we want to look at exactly what's going on so that we can learn from it and put a plan in place. So it's not about, so I totally understand about this sort of fear of failure and not trusting yourself, but it's a different, once you've sort of failed a little bit, and seeing how you can use that to help you. And then it becomes easier. And so the more you go through that sort of cycle of failing a little bit, finding out how you can use that to help you moving forward. So no one's weight loss journey is going to be a straight line down like this. Okay. If it is, then you are missing out on learning some skills that you will need to learn when you lose your weight and you want to maintain it. For most of you, the journey that I would expect is that it's up and down like this all the way with a down, over a downwards trend. And by the time you get to the point where you're maintaining your weight, you've learned all of the skills because you've messed up in all of the possible ways that you could and you've learned from them. And so then you're well equipped to manage your weight for life. Okay. But sometimes when we some come all the way down without having all of those little sort of blips, then we haven't had the opportunity to refine our skills, refine quite so many skills in handling situations. And so we need to dig deep then and do that work as we're maintaining our weight. Okay. And I recommend doing the work on the way down. Louisa, she can't join for financial reasons, but we'll be following the podcast. I totally understand. And yeah, thank you. Appreciate you following the pod- podcasts. Perry says she's got to go. I will see you on Saturday morning. Okay. Funds again. Okay. Understands. Fine. How often do you run the academy and how much more nuts do you recommend? I recommend anything but peanuts. <laughs> it's a bit of a joke between my husband and I because he always buys peanuts. And I said, they're not proper nuts, you know. Peanuts are not really proper nuts. A variety. Nuts are full of healthy nutrients. I suggest a variety of them, not the ones that are honey covered. <laughs> Although I do really like those. But yeah, try and get the ones that are, you know, more natural, less added into them and a variety. Yeah, so the this year we opened up the academy three times. We opened up in January, 
We opened up in April and this is the third and final opening of the year. So that's that's what we're doing. Okay. Catch up videos will be available until the 26th of September. In terms of cost for the Academy, you should have received some information. It's £42 per month or £420 for the year. So you get two months free. There is also a what I call a private coaching option as well, which is if you enroll as an annual member, you can get six 30 minute private coaching sessions, either taken in one block of like week on week, if you prefer, or to be taken as and when you want to. And I think the price for that is 839. So yeah, those, those are all of the three options available for the Academy. Where's the Q&A box? So the Q&A, the Q&A box is on Zoom. And there's this, this sort of chat box or the comments box if you're on Facebook. I've also got some people on Zoom here. Question, if I enjoy eating chocolate and I don't regret it during or afterwards, but I'm overweight and dislike my body and health due to overeating, how can I work on that when I don't feel bad at the time or afterwards? So the, there's no feeling bad doesn't help you. There's no upside to feeling bad. So that's the good news. So you're not missing out on anything by not feeling bad. Okay. If I join eating chocolate and don't regret it during or afterwards, but I'm overweight and dislike my body and health due to overeating. So I guess the question is, what do you want? So you can, I believe, lose weight and eat some chocolate. So if you want, do you want to lose weight whilst being able to enjoy chocolate? And if so, what would that look like for you? I don't know how frequently you're eating chocolate. I don't know how much chocolate you're eating. So I can't say whether or not it's likely to be impacting you losing weight? I'm guessing it is because you, the way you've written the question, you're thinking that it is. But I encourage you the next time you're eating chocolate to, there's another thing that we do inside of the Academy as well, which is called Tedious Powerful, where we really examine the foods that we think we really love, how much we, how much pleasure and enjoyment we get from them and for how much of the duration of eating that food. Anyway, so I would, I encourage you to really examine the pleasure that you get from chocolate. Eat your chocolate really, really mindfully, every single mouthful, and note how much pleasure you get from it. And note the point at which you stop getting pleasure from it. And just be curious about this. There's no right or wrong. And then just think about, okay, if I could have the best of both worlds here, what would it be? What would it look like for me? What would be a reasonable amount of chocolate for me to expect to eat and also enable myself to nudge my weight down? I'm guessing that there are other things that you're eating that will be either helping or hindering. I'm guessing your diet's not purely chocolate that will be helping you, helping you or hindering when it comes to being healthy in the weight that you want to be. So it's not all about the chocolate. Look at the bigger picture of how you're eating um, in other areas as well. I work with one lady who had a, what's it called? Is it the lint? Not the lint, 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 the round, the, the round balls of chocolate. One of those every evening lost loads of weight, had one of those every evening and really, really enjoyed it and savoured it. I've worked with quite a few people actually who will choose to put as a part of their food framework, as part of their food planning, chocolate on and have it every night. But it's all about, you know, finding those, the point, that intersection where you can be enjoying your chocolate and also creating the weight loss results that you want. Holly says, wish GPs would prescribe your sessions. Oh, thank you. That would be cool, wouldn't it? Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. In the Zoom room, let me see. Will this Facebook group remain open for those of us not able to join the Academy? If so, could we have a weekly check-in day? Not necessarily about actual weight loss, but how we're feeling. So the Facebook group will remain open, but there won't be any sort of formal weekly check-ins or anything like that. What I've been doing in between the doing these coaching experience weeks, and actually last time we did this coaching experience week, it was in a separate Facebook group. We did what we call a pop-up one and opened it and closed it for that. This is a bigger group and I think I've enjoyed doing it in here. So I would probably do this again. It also means that people don't miss out on it and, and things like that. But what I have been doing is a monthly, a monthly call to sort of like, you know, give you updates and talk to you about what's happening in the Facebook group, answer your questions. So things like that, but not really in a position to do something weekly because, you know, really want to put all my time and effort into supporting the ladies that um, are joining the academy. Can't join for financial reasons, but have downloaded the podcast on my way to work and are helping me. Yeah. And you have got the podcast as well. So even though I'm only in the Facebook group monthly, there's the podcasts are coming out weekly. So hopefully they can sort of help keep things going for you. All right. I think that is all the questions almost to time. Thank you again, everybody. I've really enjoyed being here with you. We So tomorrow is 
depending on how you think. Tomorrow is, there's no, you're not going to hear from me tomorrow. So I will check in the Facebook group, look for questions. If you have got a question, if you can put question or tag me, it does mean that I'm more likely to see it. It's an opportunity for you to, I don't, I don't like using the word catch up, dig a little bit deeper into something, focus on a particular topic if you would like to, or enjoy your Friday off, so to speak. And then on Saturday at 8am, I'm going to do another Q&A session. So if you've got more questions, please keep them coming. We'll do another Q&A session before we sort of kind of wrap up for the week, really. You've got access to the replays, both on the replay page, in the Facebook here, and via the private podcast until the 26th of September, and then they will be taken down. So you have got plenty of time. So, you know, if you want to chunk those down into smaller pieces and and schedule times to watch them, if you've not watched them yet, then there's different ways that you can do that. The registration page is still open as well. If you wanted to invite other people to friends or family members to come into the Facebook group and use those replay links, that's they're very welcome to do that as well. All right, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Take care. And I'll speak to you all soon. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast and are ready to live a more intentional life, lose weight as a part of that journey and create a relationship with food and yourself that you love, then I would be honoured to have you join the Lose Weight Live Life Academy membership and coach with me. The programme offers different levels of support to suit you, including self-paced learning, twice-weekly calls, private coaching, an amazingly caring community and lots more. Find out all the details about when and how you can join at www.thebestyou.coach forward slash coaching.